so the second way to package your expertise is something called productized services. When I first started talking about this, no one knew what that meant, but how many people do have heard, at least heard this term? Okay, getting better, getting better. So the definition, or at least my definition is, it's a fixed scope service that you offer at a published price. So this is like the lamp at Target. It costs this much. You're not interviewing people and finding out what their desired outcome is. It's just packaged. It's got like a big label on the front, you know, some sales page on your website. It says, here are the benefits to you. It's like, got a migraine? Motrin, you know? So whatever the problem is, you package it up and sell it, market it and sell it like a product but then you deliver it as a service. So what are some examples? Here are six, there are tons, depends on your industry and your space, but these are some, some that are very broadly applicable. The first is a simple paid consultation. So if you wanna talk to the principal about this crazy new idea you have, and there's you know, unknown unknowns, and you wanna kinda de-risk it, and you need to talk to somebody who can, you know, you've read, all, you've read a mountain of stuff online about this SEO, let's say, this thing that you're going to do, uh, but you really, you've got a bunch of questions that you have no experience with, and you, your uncertainty level is so high that you'll pay 500 or 1,000 bucks to jump on the phone and, and have a, a meeting with it, someone you trust as an expert. Uh, road mapping engagements. So if you generally start a project with this sort of discovery phase at the beginning, so like, let's say you get it, you say, ah, this would be about $100,000. Here's the estimate, stage one, is this sort of an interview stage. There's like a, kind of a kickoff with the stakeholders and then maybe you uh, disperse and interview individual stakeholders. Maybe you interview uh, end users or you know, whatever, your constitu whatever their constituents are. And then you come back with findings and recommendations. That is a roadmap. Whatever you call it is kind of like a roadmap. It's like you know where you want to go, but you're not sure how to get there. So you brought in an expert to give you a map so if you imagine driving from here to LA, you know the destination, you know you want to get to LA, and you know, roughly speaking, if you just drive west, eventually you'll probably find it, but that would be a, take a very long time. Or you could pay someone to give you a map. That's what this is, a road mapping engagement. Uh, project oversight often comes after a road map, where maybe you're doing less and less implementation, you're doing more and more brains work, not as much hands work, and you do, you're delivering these roadmaps to people, and they're just blown away. They're like, this is great, I feel this sense of certainty about what steps to take. Um, can you do it for us? Will you build this? Will you design this? Will you create or implement the execution of this thing? Maybe you say yes, but there's a, there's a model where you say no, we don't do that, but in the discovery process, we learned that your team is probably capable of it if we oversee them not manage them, but be a smart person in the room to, to warn them when they're about to step on a landmine or to guide them when there's a lack of clarity. You are a brain in the room. You're the smart person with regard to the thing that you focus on in your business, and you can oversee the project to shepherd it to success with them doing the implementation. So the model I like to use here is the sort of architect model where the architect comes up with the plans and the blueprints and the renderings and all of that stuff way up front. Uh, that doesn't mean they build the house. Some do, some are design build firms, but if they're getting out of that business, they don't wanna be in that business anymore. They could certainly introduce the, the buyer to a general contractor that they trust. They could walk the site once a week, make sure the paint's going where the paint's supposed to go and the pool's going where the pool's supposed to go. It's like, hey, everything's cool. You're an advocate for the client who is not an expert at this thing that is getting built that they're spending a ton of money on, and they will sometimes buy an insurance policy to have you stay engaged and just keep an eye on things and let them know if anything's going wrong. Uh, advisory retainers are a version of this, but they generally are independent of a project. So if your reputation is sterling and you're very well known, you're the authority on the thing that you do, you're known for it in your space, people will sometimes wanna just be able to call you and get a really quick answer to a question that only, they will only trust the answer from you or someone like you. And they will pay you handsomely on a monthly basis for you to merely pick up the phone and answer their question. I've had advisory retainers go on for years where there were giant stretches of time where no one called me. I had one where I, I think I went to two meetings, it was a year-long contract, $10,000 a month, 
And I didn't hear from them after month four. So they can be extremely profitable. <laughs>